So, oh boy, Saturday morning, 5 a.m. Eastern. I am watching it that early. WWE Super Showdown in Melbourne, Australia. It's code for a house show shown on the network that's a cash grab for a company that's looking for any potential revenue streams they can find. Now, that said, of course, if you've got the chance to put 70,000 people into a venue to watch your product, you're probably going to do it too. And for Christ's sakes, if you're willing to do it in freaking Saudi Arabia, I guess you're going to go to the land out under kangaroo on a stick for everybody. Now, I'm sure there are a massive number of people that thought that WWE Super Showdown was a super shit show. And in one way, it kind of was a shit show. Not just purely in terms of the product itself being shit. It was just a shit show, if you get what I'm saying. But it wasn't good. It felt like largely a waste of time, and yet again, is another reminder of what WWE is. A massive waste of time, where you've got this long-ass show with far too much going on, but far too little actually happening. And at the end of it, you're wondering, God, what could I have done with that time instead? And when you think about this show, keep in mind that the preeminent talking points coming out of this were two things. Guys in their 40s and 50s, way past their prime, and hair. Those are the two things that really mattered of consequence out of this shit. A bunch of guys past their prime, stars from the past, because we can't make stars today, don't want to make stars today, but then freak out when we realize that interest is bad, so we gotta sit there and bring in these stars that we don't make anymore. And hair. Especially the hair. But you look at it like the SmackDown Tag Team Championship match. It was appropriate that it's for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships, even though I was confused as hell as to whether or not it was actually for the titles or not, because when you look at it, it was a match that belonged on SmackDown. Just two teams trying to get in a bunch of crap, nobody actually had, trying to work anything here. Forgettable, champs retain, keep it moving. SmackDown Women's Championship. If anything else, I got a kick out of it, because no matter how much WWE wants to, wants to, Force Charlotte down your throat as the likable entity here. The adults in the room are saying, nah, bullshit. So many things about Becky Lynch are so much more inherently likable and inherently relatable that we're going to continue to cheer her no matter what you try to do. Because what you try to do to make her hateable is stupid anyways because you're WWE and hashtag WWE ruins everything. But they're not ruining Becky Lynch's fan love in the eyes of the fans. And the way this match ended tells a good story in the sense of it's this time Becky Lynch sits there and wins in questionable fashion. I mean, she loses, but she retains the title. And then Charlotte afterwards, she gets pissed off. So now you've got a reason for a return match. There's this 101. Then we get to Bobby Lashley and John Cena versus Elias and Kevin Owens. One opportunity I thought was missed here by Elias as he was going into his diatribe of awesome as he usually does. He should have talked about how much he'd rather be in Sydney than not. I'm sure there's a rivalry or a thing there down under. There has to be. It makes sense. Because I said so. Bunch of kangaroo fuckers. Anyways, it was a missed opportunity. But, when you look at this match, the real missed opportunity, the one that really matters, is you could either do one of two things. You could either take Elias, coming off of that massive cheap heat reaction he got in Seattle this past week, and have him do something big and significant, where there's a little bit of story there between him and Cena, and have him beat Cena. And, you know, God forbid, try to make something out of a kid. Or, if you want to go a little more established route, you can make this Bobby Lashley's opportunity, Bobby Lashley's moment, Bobby Lashley's time to shine at a time where, good God, he needs something. 
So WWE went with option C. And for you TNA fans, it's not that C that you're thinking of. It is option Cena. Let Bobby Lashley get the heat. Let Bobby Lashley get beat the fuck down. Let John Cena come in and make the big heroic save and win the match. <sighs> with the sixth move to do right, son of a bitch. It's not bad enough that John Cena comes out with that JBL hairstyle. And not just a JBL hairstyle, like the twink bottom JBL hairstyle with the bald spot to match. Very nice. And yes, for some of you a-holes that are going to talk about hairlines, let's get a close-in look. 38 in March. Some of y'all that are going to be 28 wish you had this, let alone 38. So step the fuck off. But we're talking more about Cena's hair than anything else that happened in the match, or for the most part, on the entire damn show. And what the fuck did he become a Kung Fu master? What the hell did he become Kung Fu Cena? hi -ya! Even the Kung Fu looks like shit. I appreciate the troll factor. Not just of the hairstyle, but calling the Kung Fu Cena chop. The sixth move of doom. But Funaki, you should be suing him. Because there's only one Kung Fu master in WWE. And it's Kung Fu Maki. But this was lazy. This was pathetic. This was bad. This was, we got to give Cena a pathetic reason to freaking shine. No, the hell you didn't. Have Cena get the heat. Have Cena be the one get beat down. Have Bobby Lashley make the save. Or have Cena tried to come in to make the save and have Elias beat him. That's either option A or option B. So of course the company goes with option Cena. And the whole thing sucked. And we're talking more about his freaking hair between his JBL lookalike, the twink bottom version, and the bald spot up top. Don't go to LeBron's guy, though, because those plugs aren't going to look good. Go to Erlacher's dude. Like, Erlacher got solid work, John. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But that's all that matters with Cena's hair. That's appropriate. Cena himself is now embracing the farce that he's been for so many years and how appropriate. The guy that the company sunk all those resources into for more than a decade, this is what you get. The Iconics... The Australian lasses defeat Asuka and Naomi, and we'll keep it moving. The WWE Championship, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles. The good thing about this show is I haven't watched anything really pertaining to WWE in over a month. So the stuff is fresh. I'm not truly trying to pick apart any stories leading up to it. I can just kind of catch up at the moment and see what I think. But when you're going down this whole route of Samoa Joe stalking AJ's family and trying to get into his head that way, when the actual moment comes at hand, you've got AJ Styles coming out after Samoa Joe. Like, to me, this is where the little things in professional wrestling get missed so often because they're lazy. It's so easy just to do the pre-packaged video package and all of that and forget about some of the small, subtle touches. Like, I don't know about any of y'all, but if you loved your wife, your kids, your family, whoever, or your lady, your wife, or your husband, focus on the wife part, but if you loved them that much, and you found out the dude that had been harassing them, stalking them, was in the same venue as you, aren't you going to do everything you can to hunt down that person? Like, you should have been showing AJ Styles throughout the whole show trying to hunt down Samoa Joe until Samoa Joe makes his entrance, and here comes AJ Styles making a beeline. Fuck the entrance music. Fuck the this. Fuck the wearing the belt. Fuck any of it. AJ Styles should be about one thing, and that's fucking Samoa Joe up. And even at one point in time as this match is going on, it was like we finally started to get some extreme shit happening in this, what, no disqualification match. And I think it was Michael Cole called it out. Oh, yeah. This waited a long time to get to that. Yeah. This should have been balls to the walls, extreme crap, and it just wasn't. It was weird and very frustrating for me to watch. I'll say that. And it is what it is. And I'm disappointed because I was hoping for a lot more. Uh, Ronda Rousey, I thought, looked good. Another star-making type of moment for her. The Bella Sluts are the Bella Sluts and all types of inherently annoying. 
and Ruby Riot continues to toil away on her squad that's going nowhere fast. That's about all I can say about that. The Cruiserweight Championship was actually my match of the night. I like that more than anything else. You let the Cruiserweights do Cruiserweight crap. It's amazing how much better it is. Everybody can have a role and a purpose on the show. This is what the Cruiserweights are supposed to be. I was surprised, actually, and maybe it was because it was in another country. It wasn't here in the U.S., and they don't go there very often in Australia. They didn't want to piss off the whole time fans by having the Iconics lose or having Buddy Murphy lose here. They had Buddy Murphy beat Cedric Alexander, and Buddy Murphy, I thought, looked like a couple hundred thousand bucks in this. I thought he looked pretty good. Why didn't he look like a million bucks? More like 205,000 bucks? Because he's a cruiserweight, and WWE doesn't want to make big, massive stars out of their cruiserweights. I'm just saying, and you know it's true. But I thought it was a really good match. These are the types of matches where I'm okay with there not being as much selling with the spot after spot after spot, the false finish after false finish, because that's the type of style these guys are supposed to work traditionally, so I'm okay with that. But then you follow it right up with the Shield, taking on Braun Strowman and the other two fucks, and I just... You know, we're teasing Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose, and I'll take a pass on that dog. And just this whole thing, I'm looking at Braun Strowman, and I'm like, so we did all of this just so that way what? Drew McIntyre could have something to do just so that way, excuse me. <laughs> Fuck, Dolph Ziggler could have something to do? Because you couldn't let somebody potentially get over Roman Reigns? I'm sorry. Sure, some of y'all enjoyed the match. It was just that type of thing I was thinking about the entire time. I just couldn't get past it. I'm like, oh boy, it's another faction versus faction match. I'm good with all that crap. But in hindsight, I wish I would have tried to enjoy it more because you can't imagine my massive disappointment to Daniel Bryan against The Miz with the winner getting a future title shot. The fuck was this? Like, what the fuck was this? Of all the creative things you could have done, of all the interesting, compelling, great things you could have done. You chose this abortion of a brain fart of a booking decision to fucking do. Like, it was so bad, nobody saw it coming. And sometimes that's a great thing, and sometimes it's a stupid thing. And in this case, it was a stupid and ridiculous fucking thing. Nobody saw it coming because it was poorly timed. It didn't make sense for anything story-related. The commentators were off. Everybody was fucking off. What a waste of a fucking feud. Now, surely this is not the last installment of this. But this was lame. This was a massive disappointment because when I see Daniel Bryan and The Miz on the card, I actually give a crap. But now it's like one of those few rare things that I have that I can still latch on to involving WWE's product where I can kind of sort of get invested and kind of sort of give a crap. They do everything they can to undercut it, cut its legs off, and ruin it for me. Why? Because again, hashtag WWE World Especially knowing what was going to come in the main event, I'm like, you could have given me a regular match. Even a regular match would have been a massive upgrade over the shit show that we got with this one. Holy Christ. But that doesn't even begin to add up to what was the main event. Oh my God. WrestleMania 28, end of an era match, until the next time they face off. Here at Super Showdown, Melbourne, Australia, last time ever until the next time ever. You still got to make it about the guys in their 40s and their 50s and all this shit that they've been fighting about for freaking years. And it's not just Undertaker and God. Here's Kane in one quarter. Shouldn't he be running the county as freaking mayor in Tennessee? And Shawn Michaels, what the hell is going on with his hair? We're talking about John Cena having hair, well, at least in some places, and Shawn Michaels not having any. Now he looks like cancer patient Kane, not just me. Welcome to the club, HB Shizzle. Holy hell. And you get a match like this. The hell else do you expect it to be other than magically at the 11th hour and 59th minute and 59th second? It's a no disqualification match because Triple H and Taker can't have a good match without having that stipulation. Well, the stipulation wasn't going to happen here. Because being between Taker barely being able to get up and move, Hunter sucking so much wind, you thought he hit 
and went through like a massive bong frenzy before he went down the freaking ramp. This was bad. You got taken. Uh, uh, uh. You got hundred. Uh, 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 uh. I mean, Jesus H. Christ. Extreme stipulations can help. But sometimes they're not going to be enough. What's the, what's the saying? Put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. Well, you spray some deodorizer in a bathroom that somebody just dropped a massive deuce bomb in, it's still probably going to have remnants of ass hair and deuce bomb in it. And this match was brutal to get through. And of course, because it's a Triple H match, it lasts forever. It's a match you've seen time and time again. Taker really serves no purpose anymore. You've seen Hunter lose too many times. So of course now, when it really doesn't matter, when there's no streak at play, when there's a limited impact, now of course God is going to beat The Undertaker. Now there is definitely a part of this to me when you're talking about the majesty and the magnificence of the ego of God himself on everything that is the three books of the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. There is a part of me, as an egomaniac myself, that absolutely freaking loves this. He made sure he went on last. He made sure he beat Taker. It was close. Ho! Stick that in your pipe, Bobby Roode, and smoke it. But understand me that this is ultimately all about one thing. And that is after all these years of saying all this crap, it looks like it's all about building towards The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at freaking WrestleMania next year! So after all that crap, all these years, all those missed opportunities that you could have had Shawn Michaels actually wrestle somebody, now we're getting the urge, everybody involved, and we want to have Shawn Michaels wrestle one more time at WrestleMania. And it's going to be against the fucking Undertaker? <laughs> what? I know it's wrestling. And retirement stipulations are for the birds anyways. We all know they're bullshit and they don't matter. And in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. It's Shawn Michaels' career. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. But I'm sorry. If H.B. Shizzle is going to get back in the ring hizzle, I would like to not see the shit drizzle at WrestleMania next year when it's him and Taker in the damn ring. Because what makes you think that that match is going to be any good? What makes you think that these two guys are going to be able to do what they need to do, especially knowing if it's featuring those two guys that you don't have any active stars on the main roster, any real superstars, that match has the fucking main event, unless you're talking about Rousey, and you're really going to sit there and main event Ronda Rousey over Undertaker Shawn Michaels 3 at WrestleMania? Like, literally, Super Showdown was about hair and building towards Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 35. By God! End of an era of my ass. Last time under my ass. We're gonna party like it's 2011, bitches! 2012, bitches! And since it's now involved in Shawn Michaels, we're gonna party like it's 2010 and the last fucking decade, bitches! When you think about shit show, this is the definition of shit show. Fly all of your talent to Australia. Put an event on that shown in the U.S. starting at 5 a.m. Eastern. Pack in 70,000 people so that way your most prominent people are all guys in their 40s and 50s, well past their primes, and we're talking about hair and WrestleMania rematches. It's true. WWE ruins everything. If you enjoyed this shit show, God fucking speed to you. Because Super Showdown was a shit show.